different codons that a single tRNA will recognize occur in the third position of the codon triplet. Remember, when we looked at the redundancy in the genetic code, we saw that, by and large, this redundancy, different codons coding for the same amino acid, um, uh, occurred in differences in just the third position. So it turns out that on a molecular level, in the binding between an anticodon of a tRNA and the codon of the messenger RNA in which it will interact, the third position of that, cod- of that codon and anticodon interaction has less of an influence on achieving some sort of hydrogen bonding molecular specificity in their connection. We call that relaxation third position wobble. Okay. Now, so we have a number of different tRNAs, each of which differs in its anticodon in a way that allows us to understand how, it can, how tRNAs can be specifically interacting with codons on messenger RNAs, which is the first part of the puzzle that we have to solve. The other end of a tRNA molecule, opposite the anticodon, is the place where the appropriate amino acid needs to be attached. Now, in the example I just gave, for example, you'd need to put a leucine on the end of that if you had an anticodon that was specifying leucine on the first end. In other words, the tRNA, in order to accomplish this translation, has to both recognize the right codon, and we can see how that can be done with complementary base pairing, and also has to be attached to the right amino acid corresponding to that codon. This is a trickier problem. Because if you look at the structure of tRNAs, it turns out that this end to which the amino acid will be attached does not vary. Every tRNA has the same end. And yet, somehow different amino acids, the appropriate amino acid, are connected up with the different appropriate tRNAs. So that's the key question we have to turn to now. How does the correct amino acid become associated with the correct tRNA? Well, the answer to that question comes from another molecule, which you might guess is an enzyme. It's an enzyme that has a name that um, I love and hate at the same time. Let me give you the name. These enzymes have had relatively easy names up to this point, but this one rolls off the tongue like um, a hot knife through butter. It's aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Now, that's a mouthful of a name, but it actually does specify, as I've told you, what the function of that enzyme is. It is an enzyme that synthesizes, synthetase, a bond between an amino acid, that's where the amino acyl comes in, and a tRNA. So amino acyl tRNA synthetase, enzyme that synthesizes a connection between an amino acid and a tRNA. It's amino acyl tRNA synthetase that solves the problem I just posed, connecting up a particular tRNA with the right amino acid. But the question is, how does this do it? The way it does it is by having two separate binding sites, the amino acyl's tRNA synthetase. One binding site is specific for a particular transfer RNA. Now remember, the way that proteins function largely has to do with structure. So the structure of this protein has a region in it that will interact because of its shape and the unique physical chemical characteristics of the um, molecule or the atoms around that uh, piece of the shape will interact specifically with just one kind of tRNA based on the structure of that tRNA. The other binding site of the amino acyl tRNA synthetase molecule is specific for just one kind of amino acid. So it's amino acyl... uh, (laughs) So it's amino acyl tRNA synthetase, which knows how to recognize independently the tRNA and the amino acid associated with it. It's kind of like a matchmaker. It brings these two correct molecules together, and then once they've both bound to this enzyme, the enzyme catalyzes a strong bond between them, and they now leave the enzyme, and they're correctly attached. So we've solved the problem with the translator molecule being uh, a tRNA and the correct connection with the amino acid being facilitated by this unique enzyme tRNA synthetase. We've solved the problem of connecting the language of amino acids to the language of nucleic acids.
Well, now that we've got what you might call a, um, a charged tRNA, a tRNA with an amino acid, the correct one attached, now we get to the machine that actually builds the proteins, the third of our three major players that we started with. This machine is called a ribosome. If we were to use our enzyme naming scheme, we might want to call a ribosome a protein polymerase because it is um, a structure that polymerizes amino acids to build polypeptide chains, which are proteins. It's not really a protein polymerase, though, because it's not just one enzyme. In fact, the ribosome is a very large, I mean massively large and very complex aggregate of a number of different molecules that work together. One of the major constituents of the ribosome is yet another kind of RNA. We call this ribosomal RNA, or rRNA for short. This ribosomal RNA makes up about 60% of the structure of the ribosome. The remaining 40% of the structure is made up of a number of different kinds of catalytic proteins. Again, the ribosomal RNA and the proteins all come together to form a large coherent unit. But the ribosome does act as a kind of protein polymerase in the sense that it's what brings the messenger RNA, the transfer RNAs together, and then forms chemical bonds between what will be adjacent amino acids in the protein when we're finished. Okay, let's take a break here and see where we are. We've got our three major players. We've got the messenger, we've got the translator, and we've got the protein builder. How do these major players work together in translation to actually build a protein? You can imagine, at this point, we could get into many, many details um, of exactly how ribosomes work. What we want to do, though, is to just uh, focus on the essential points about how these particular players get together to achieve what we know is the basic output that we have to get, which is the ordered uh, bonding of the series of amino acids for the particular protein that we're trying to build. For the sake of simplicity, we can separate the process of protein synthesis into three stages. We have to initiate the project, call it initiation, get it started. Once we've gotten it started, then we can go through an extensive phase of just elongating the growing peptide chain. We'll call that elongation. And then we have to stop it. We have to terminate it. Now, I separate these because what's critical to understand about these three, there, there are different things that are critical to understand about these three phases of protein synthesis. So let's start with how the process actually gets initiated. Ribosomes can be divided into or are divided into two main subunits, a larger subunit and a smaller subunit. Initiation, before initiation occurs, these two subunits occur separately in the cytoplasm of the cell. Initiation starts when a small subunit of the ribosome binds to two things. First, a messenger RNA molecule, we've got to get the message in, and also a special tRNA that acts as the initiator tRNA. Let's go back to the genetic code. You might guess at what that initiator tRNA is going to be specifying. It's going to have the uh, anticodon that corresponds to the start codon in the genetic code, AUG, which codes for methionine. So the initiator tRNA is going to have a methionine attached to it. Now, once we bring the messenger RNA, the initiator tRNA, and the small subunit of the ribosome together, then the other half of the ribosome, or the other larger half of the uh, ribosome, comes and sits on that complex, and transcription begins. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of geometry of uh, the ribosome so we can understand both this process of initiation and also how elongation occurs after we've initiated the process. If you sort of think of a ribosome very schematically, if you just draw a very simple schematic of a, of a ribosome, you're looking head-on at this ribosome, sort of a big globular say, shape, you'll see, or you could draw on that, what are effectively three different binding sites where tRNAs will interact with the molecule. 
And I'm going to just list these for you because the orientation of these will help provide insight into the initiation and elongation phase. On either end of the 